Now, um, before we get stuck into it, let's have another prayer and um, we'll, we'll see what we can discover together. Father God, thank you that we can freely gather together and, and dig into your word and Lord, I just ask that you pour out your Holy Spirit on us now, move on our hearts and help us to hear from you. Uh, remove the distraction and allow us to understand uh, a message for our time and a message that's relevant that we can apply. Thank you for being present with us and thank you for what you're going to do. Amen. Now, credit for this, a lot of uh, my research has come from the book. That's a bit hard to see maybe, but it's The Death and Rebirth of the Investigative Judgment by a fellow named Marcos Torres. He's an American pastor but it's actually living in Perth. And this has been a book that I've been reading and trying to understand when exploring this topic. So if, if what I share today interests you, and if you're genuinely just interested in the judgment, I highly recommend this book in terms of understanding how this is relevant for our time. Also, shout out to the Wednesday night Bible study group who helped me process these ideas as well, so you guys know who you are. But um, the, the question I really want to be exploring when looking at this is, so what? When we, we come across this passage in Daniel chapter 8, and we're told there's a time period and then the, the sanctuary is going to be cleansed or restored. And I'm wondering why that's relevant for me. I'm wondering why that's relevant for you. What difference does it make when we, we discover what's taking place in the heavenly sanctuary? Now, at no point today am I questioning the validity of this. I'm talking about utility. So I'm, I'm fully supportive of it. I believe this is biblical. Uh, we're not going to be exploring... The, the fundamentals of this doctrine, but rather how I apply it to my life. So at no point do I disagree with this. I'm asking the question, how do I apply it to my life and why is it relevant for average Joe walking down the street? Why is it relevant for my, my family and my friends? This is what we're exploring today. Why? So what? And before we get to that, we need to explore this idea of relevance. What makes something relevant? When we look at the definition, relevance is the degree to which something is related or useful to what is happening or being talked about. So we get a bit of a formula there. Relevance comes from a primary idea, so a topic is being talked about. You add a secondary idea to that, and that makes a topic relevant. Now, if you're having a discussion with your friend about pizza, and then I come up to you while you're talking about pizza and I butt in and go, so I was just in South Africa recently, had a brilliant time. You're probably thinking, Josh, what are you doing, you numbskull? That's got nothing to do with what we're talking about. It's irrelevant. But if I come to you and say, while I was in South Africa, had the most amazing wood-fired pizza. I don't know how they do it, but South Africans nail pizza. Maybe the Italians got there early on and left the secrets. I don't know, but... When, when I share this secondary idea to the primary idea of pizza, it's relevant. It drives the conversation forward. So this is, this is how we get something that's relevant. Now, when we look at this topic of the investigative judgment, the 2300 days, I'm asking the question, okay, so what does it add to primary ideas being talked about? Where, where is this topic relevant? How does it add to my experience with God? I've got some possible answers, and you could probably think of some as well. Now, this, this, it's not an exhaustive list, but it's just a few areas where, where maybe we could answer the question why this matters. And the first one is academic usefulness. This, this, this passage and this, this doctrine helps tie together the loose ends and the tension between Arminianism and Calvinism. And if you're wondering what those two words are, this already is irrelevant to you. I don't know how many blokes are sitting in the, in the pub discussing the tension between Calvinism and Arminianism. So academic usefulness doesn't necessarily speak to a primary idea. It's useful, but it's useful to academics. It's useful to Bible students. How is that relevant for everyone else? Another way is that it provides transparency in terms of God and God's actions. 
Now, this is helpful for us as Bible students, but I don't know many people who are lying awake at night going, is God transparent? This one's probably the strongest argument that I could think of personally, the vindication of God's character. When we look into this, what it reveals is that God is completely, as we said, transparent, but it reveals God's love in everything that God has done and is doing, his character, he operates from this position of love. And this is really beneficial from an emotional perspective because there's, there's a connection between our understanding of who God is and, and our emotional state. And when we misunderstand God's character, that can have a negative impact on our emotions. So this one does have some relevance. But the challenge is, is the way we articulate the investigative judgment is so complex that you have to work your way through all these charts and documents to get to a point where you go, God's character has been vindicated and you can get lost in it. So, so while this is helpful, it's not simple. There's the benefit for the angels. The, the question comes in verse 13, how long? And we're going to explore that, but you could say that the investigative judgment provides insights for the angelic realm as to when God's going to finally resolve the problem of sin. And so you could say, well, that's a, a primary question the angelic realm is talking about. So that's relevant for them. How is that relevant for us? It gives Adventism an identity. So that maybe that's relevant for Adventists, but what about everyone else? And if this is the only reason why we have it, how useful is it really? It protects us from legalism and antinomialism. So legalism being an attempt to save myself by my own efforts. Antinomialism is that the law doesn't count at all and I can do whatever I want. Once again, it's, it's, it's very much relevant for those who are entrenched in biblical study. Relevant maybe for us as Christians, but what about for other individuals who aren't studying the Bible? For average Joes, how do we make this relevant for everyone else? It intensifies our belief that the second coming is soon. It gives us a timeline that tells us we know we're in the last days because the final time period is, has come to a conclusion and the next thing that happens is the second coming. And so this can give us a boost in terms of um, an emotional excitement, readiness for the second coming. But that's short-lived in terms of we still have to go through the day-to-day -day life. It doesn't have a long-lasting impact necessarily. And once again, if you're not asking the question, when's Jesus coming back, it's, it's, it's not relevant to the... It's not speaking into a primary idea. It reveals what Jesus has been up to. So Jesus said he was coming back, and he's not here yet. And so we can explore this and find out this whole time, what has Jesus been up to in heaven? What's been taking place? But if you're not asking the question, where is Jesus and what is he doing? It's not a secondary idea that, that adds relevance to it. So we come back to this idea of relevance. How can we communicate this, this, in, this, this idea in a way that actually adds to our lives? And just to solidify, I'm not by any means undermining this at all. I am fully on board with it. We're just talking about utility. How can we make this more useful? So essentially what I'm talking about is, is reframing it. Now, it, it's reframing an idea so that it's beneficial to us. And this is something we actually see that Jesus did with reframing the gospel. Reframing is not re redefining, it's different. So Jesus would reframe his message depending on who he's talking to. So in John chapter 3, the, the kingdom, he talks about being born again. But in chapter 4, to an, a different individual, the woman at the well, he says that the kingdom of God is, is, is like waters flowing, living waters. So he's reframed the message for the individual to make it relevant for them because their primary idea they're talking about is different. Are we following this so far? So reframing is a biblical idea. Paul did this himself. To the Greeks, he became a Greek. To the Jews, he became a Jew. He doesn't redefine the message. He's recontextualizing it so that it helps, that it's beneficial. Now, I think a, a primary idea that, or to say that again, a universal 
primary idea that all of us have asked at some point and experienced is to do with suffering. Why suffering? And that could be relevant for you right now in the midst of this. When we look around the globe, the world is hurting. There's a whole lot of pain and suffering and you can ask the question, why? And this is not something new. It's not something that's going away anytime soon. Suffering is a primary idea that all of us have experienced and all of us at some one point or another ask the question, why and what's God doing about it? This goes back to the garden. When, when God creates the garden, Adam and Eve, everything is good. But then after the fall, when the relationship between Adam and Eve is severed from God, they are thrust into a, a place of suffering. And not only that, once they are disconnected from God, they actually begin to perpetuate suffering themselves. So the human condition now is not only one of being disconnected from God, but it is one of perpetuating suffering and making it worse. Hurt people hurt people. Broken people break people. You see this flow forward, and we see it in the book of Daniel as well. And when we think about this story, Daniel, a 17-year-old man, lives in a nation who is conquered by another army. You imagine the suffering that's involved with that. His city was destroyed, friends and family killed, he's taken to a foreign land, he's in the midst of suffering. And that's the context of the book of Daniel, is pain and suffering. And so when we're reading it, we need to have a firm grasp on, on what his experience was like. So does the passage in Daniel chapter 8 have anything to say about suffering? Does it have a secondary idea to add to this primary idea of, of pain and suffering? If you've got your Bibles there, open up to Daniel chapter 8. We're going to explore this passage from verse 11 through to 14 and just, just break it up a little bit and see if we can draw some meaning from it. So Daniel chapter 8. And we'll pick it up from verse, verse 11. And Daniel's having a dream. Um, to, to simplify it, from verse 11, we've got the enemy of God who growing in power. We, we won't get into the finer details, but what we're focusing on here is the enemy of God. From verse 11, it became great, even as great as the prince of the host, that's referring to Christ, and the regular burnt offering was taken away from him. And the place of his sanctuary was overthrown. And the host will be given over to it together with the regular burnt offering because of transgression. And it will throw truth to the ground. It will speak, it will act and prosper. Then I heard a holy one speaking and another holy one said to the one who spoke, For how long is the vision concerning the regular burnt offering, the transgression that makes desolation and the giving over of the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot. And he said to me, for 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary shall be restored to its rightful place. All right, so there's a few things that we need to unpack in this passage. Firstly, it's touching on the sanctuary. Now, to give you a, a really quick summary, that the sanctuary is essentially God's pl blueprint for restoration, but there's two things that I want you to hold on to when we're thinking of the sanctuary. First, Exodus 25.8 said, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell with them. God's desire is to be with his people. That's the first thing that the sanctuary is about. God's wanting to reverse the separation that was caused by the fall. He wants to be with his people. The second part that we want to cling on to is you take from John chapter 1.29, where John the Baptist calls out and says, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. What God wants to do is to restore us to a place where we can be with him. This is what the sanctuary is all about. So we're, we're, we've been doing this series over the last know, few weeks. We've, 
We've lost track with Christmas and New Year's, but we've been exploring the sanctuary. And if you don't take anything else from this, the sanctuary is about God's desire to be with his people. And the way that he's doing that is through Jesus. That's what the sanctuary is all about. Now then, when we look at this verse, and we see that in verse 11, the regular burnt offering was taken away and the place of his sanctuary was overthrown. God's enemy here tramples the sanctuary to the ground, even says it tramples truth to the ground, and then takes away the burnt offering. So what the enemy is essentially doing is trying to perpetuate the suffering that's taking place. God's plan is to restore everything. And if the plan is in the sanctuary, God's enemy comes to the sanctuary, squashes it to the ground, and then takes away the burnt offering, which is some symbolic of Christ's sacrifice. This message was telling us that God's enemy was going to hide the truth, make it hard to understand, remove God's plan, and remove the sacrifice that saves us. That's what this vision is about. And the reason why God's enemy does this is to perpetuate suffering. Because if we're not reconnected to God, our, our hearts in the condition as they are by default, as descendants of Adam, we will perpetuate the suffering. And you see this happens in Genesis. First generation, you've got Cain and Abel. And there's murder straight away. They go from disobeying God, one generation later, the suffering that, that, that flows on from that is murder and death. The human condition without God's intervention is one that perpetuates suffering. And I'm sure you can see that around you guys. I'm sure if you looked hard enough in your own heart, you can see where you've perpetuated suffering. I know I can. The question that then comes is, is, is why? Why is he casting it to the ground? He just wants to drag it out longer. But the question is asked in verse 13. Then I heard the Holy One speak, and then another Holy One said to the one who spoke, for how long is the vision concerning the regular burnt offering? How long? That's, that's a question that comes from a, a place of dif- discomfort. Uh, parents get the question from the kids, how long till we get there? Uh, employees get the question from their employees, how long till smoker? But I think it's a question that comes up from, from the pit of desperation. How long until freedom? I can, I can picture the, the prisoners in Auschwitz asking how long until the Allies get here? How long until the slaves are freed? How long until injustice is overturned and those who are oppressed are freed? This is a question from a position of pain and suffering. How much longer will the truth about who God is and his plan to restore humanity and the earth be trampled? How long will there be lies cast against his name? How long, how much longer Will people be misled in terms of how they can be restored and made whole? That's the question that's being asked here. The angelic realm is in pain as well as they look on earth. And they're asking that question, God, when are you going to intervene? When is enough enough? And we're told that there would come a point in time where God would draw a line in the sand and say, enough is enough. We're moving into the next phase of the plan. We're going to re-establish the sanctuary It says in verse 14, for 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary shall be restored to its rightful state. Some versions would say the sanctuary would be cleansed. And while this is very much about this this phase of judgment and, and cleansing the heavenly sanctuary, it's just as much about God restoring the truth of his plan and the truth of what Christ has done for each and every one of us. There's, there's three questions that get asked by, by psychotherapists when, when they're working with a client. One is starting with the original, original purpose of the individual. Then you move on to, well, what's the problem? What's deviated you from per- your purpose? And the third is, what's the solution? 
And when we, look, when we look in Scripture, our original purpose as humans was to reveal God's goodness, reveal His character, to be loved, to love and be loved. We were created in His image to be able to reveal a relational God. And when the fall occurred, it deviated the plan. We become perpetuators of suffering. That's the problem. We've been separated. And as long as there is separation, suffering will occur. Separation leads to suffering. But God's plan, his solution, is that restoration. That once again, his people would actually come to reflect his character. And there's this idea that where we're referred to as God's temple, that we collectively as God's people are his sanctuary, his living sanctuary. And when God initiates this plan of cleansing the sanctuary and restoring it, that's when he starts dwelling in us in a new way, in a way where his character will be seen once again, just as it was in Eden. This, this, this gives a new lens to this message. It, it, it gives us a responsibility to become, rather than individuals who cause suffering, we become individuals who are agents of reversal. I really like this statement. It comes from Nathan Brown's book, Agents of Reversal. God is reversing sin and suffering in the world. But not only is he reversing it, he's also cutting off the source. And the source at the moment is the human heart. Humans cause pain and suffering. All you've got to do is look through history and you see it. Left to our own devices, we are self-destructive, cruel, cruel creatures. But God has the solution. And you see the solution in the sanctuary where we, we are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And you, you could look at three phases, three phases within the, um, the sanctuary service. First, the sinner comes, confesses their sin onto the lamb, and they leave cleansed, free from sin. That lamb is slain, and then the blood is brought before God. After that, though, that individual becomes, once again, able to love like God loves. And so first God begins with restoring the individual but then a collection of individuals becomes a restored community and restored communities eventually leads to restored civilization that's what we look forward to but in the meantime we're called to be part of the solution rather than part of the problem now the challenge with this is there's there's no sitting on the fence. If you're not part of the solution, if you're not an agent of reversal, you're a perpetuator of pain and suffering. There's, there's no sitting on the fence with this. And it becomes so crucial then to ensure we've experienced step one and letting that, the Lamb of God take away your sin, letting God restore your heart because without that, no amount of effort on our part will allow us to be agents of reversal. Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Now, can a leopard change its spots? And if, if we're accustomed to being evil, as the Bible says, but perpetuators of selfishness and suffering, we can't in and of our own strength change ourselves. We actually can create more suffering through self-justification and, and, and trying to fix it ourselves. And you see this in Eden as well. So first Adam and Eve are, are, are led to rebel against God. But then there's the first sin that flows on from that. So originally they created good and there's no desire within them to perpetuate sin. Their desire is for good but they were led astray. But then you see Adam's response after the fall is for self-preservation and justification. And he points the finger at Eve and says it's her fault. He perpetuates the suffering. 
his heart is depraved and disconnected from God. And so from that point forward, anyone who is a descendant of Adam has that same condition. Even with the best desires, a broken heart's going to break others. So unless we've experienced redemption and unless we're experiencing what God is offering us at Calvary, we can't be a part of the change. We will be a part of the problem. And you actually see this happen in churches. And the reason I think for that is because religion is one of the best places to hide from God. Because you can pretend like you're being righteous. You can pretend like you've got it all together. But if we haven't had that conversion experience, we will perpetuate suffering. And this is why countless individuals have come to church communities and experienced hurt. Many of us here, I'm sure you are aware of this, I'm sure you've experienced it. This is the reason why. It's the human condition. I'm a part of this as well. Hurt people hurt people. And if we're not experiencing Calvary, even if we come to church, put out our nice clothes, we will perpetuate suffering. We'll do more harm than good. And people looking for God, looking for redemption, find pain and suffering instead. And the devil runs his, rubs his hands together because the sanctuary is cast down and it's trampled. And the sacrifice is taken away. But this is not God's desire. And so we're not going to focus on that. We're going to focus on the truth. And that is Christ as our solution. We can't change our own hearts. But when Christ is lifted up, all men will be drawn to him. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away your sin. Behold the Lamb of God who wants to give you a new heart, put his spirit within you, so you can love like he loves and become an agent of reversal. I want to be that kind of individual. I don't want to be perpetuating suffering anymore. But left to my own devices, I don't have a choice. If I don't fall on the rock and allow it to break me, Eventually, it'll crush me. If I don't allow God to re restore me, I'm better off staying on my own. Because I could be used to do more harm than good. So when we, when we go back to this idea of relevance, the primary idea of suffering, we live in a world, we live in a community, we live in a state of suffering. And this message here has told us that God is doing a new thing. He's initiated this process where his people are going to be agents of change. It is happening now. And he's calling us to be a part of it, each and every one of us. And I can imagine us as a community Imagine us when each one of us has come to the cross and experienced the transformation that comes from laying your sins on our Saviour, experiencing transformation of a heart and being able to love like God loves. Imagine what God could do with us. Imagine the healing that would take place in you, in me, in the circles of our loved ones. When I, when I look at this, I get excited because I see the potential. And when you look in our, our history as a, as a church, we were a movement. And when we understood this at the start, it impacted how we went about life. It impacted our actions. And during America, during the slave period, Adventists were told to go against the law at the time. The law said that if a slave had escaped from their owner and you came across that slave, you legally had to return it to the owner. Adventists pushed back against that. They raged against the injustice and they were encouraged not to. 
That's amazing. I wish we had more stories like that. We've also got stories where we were perpetuating suffering, where Adventists were the ones that were leading the way to cause the pain and the injustice. But what would happen if we refocused on becoming people transformed? Because it naturally flows. People who focus on Christ become agents of reversal. And I wonder then, what, you know, what would have taken place during Nazi Germany if there was a people willing to push back and rage against it instead of going along with it? What would have happened? What is God calling us to push back against now? Like, what are the injustices in our community? Where can we be agents of change? Or maybe in our, our workplaces, in our families. Where is God calling us to be the difference? But that flows on from that first step. And the first step is to come to Calvary. Surrender your brokenness to God and let him crucify it. Because if your heart isn't crucified, it's going to run amok. So the question I want to ask you guys is that seeing that God is, is doing this new thing, and he's creating essentially his, his, his soldiers, his army, agents of reversal, communities of them. Do you want to be a part of it? Do you want to be one of these agents of reversal? What's it going to take to be one? What's the next step for you? That's between you and God. But take that to God. Take that decision. We can't change our hearts ourselves. And so I'm just urging us this morning, myself included, to start this year refocusing on Calvary, refocusing on cross, on, on the cross. It's the only way that we can be a part of what God's doing. It's the only way that we can be restored. It's the only way that we can avoid being perpetuators of suffering. It's to focus on Christ and surrender everything to him.